Welcome to Transforming Indian Family Court System. We have heard Mr. Nelson Mandela, the famous uh, president of uh, South Africa, say something which reverberated with us significantly. He said, there is no keener revelation to a society's soul than the way it treats its children. And it is in that regard with rising divorce and parental separation rates that we at Bamboo Tree Children's Foundation and Child Rights Foundation conducted a detailed pan-India survey of more than 500 parents who've been through the family court system and approximately 60 legal professionals who've handled more than 1,500 child custody disputes. Unfortunately, the findings reveal a failed and a dysfunctional family court system which is actually causing harm to our children. Since more than nine out of 10 legal professionals believe that the family court system has failed our children and is in need of urgent reforms. Therefore, as part of our endeavor to initiate conversations about children of separated parents, we are inviting a number of legal and mental health professionals from across the world to share their thoughts and formulate a consensus regarding the kind of reforms that would make the family court system child and litigant friendly. In this regard, I am extremely delighted to welcome a very special guest today with us. This is an advocate with more than 25 years of experience and she practices only family law. She is an advocate at not just the Bombay High, uh, Bombay High Court and the Bombay Family Courts, but also in Supreme Court of India, and is an extremely vocal advocate for children of separated parents. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Tobin Irani. Welcome Hi. to the broadcast, Ms. Irani. Thank you very much for having me on this broadcast and giving me the opportunity to speak my mind. Pleasure. Thank you so much. And we also have with us the founder of Child Rights Foundation, Mr. Jatin Patira, who, uh, as I spoke earlier, has been, uh, been fighting for children of separated parents through his NGO for almost more than 10 years now and is a partner with us in this uh, survey findings. The survey findings are available in the form of a video on our YouTube channel. The link is provided in the description below. But diving straight deep down into the uh, questions, uh, Ms. Irani, uh, we did share with you the survey findings earlier. Uh, and I believe you've also been through our video of the survey findings. Uh, what do you feel about it? Did you find these shocking? Do the uh, findings worry you? Are you in any way concerned about the children? What are your first thoughts about it? I am, in fact, experiencing what you have recorded in your survey. And it's really, really heart-wrenching and disturbing to see this before my own eyes. I mean, I'm trying my best to make courts realize what we're doing, the entire fabric of our society, future is getting destroyed but there's only so much that I can do. In fact, I would like to emphasize in one of my matters, the family court itself has noted that the court has failed a child. No, that's extremely unfortunate. Very, very unfortunate the way, because the findings, I mean, if I were to just quickly uh, talk about the findings, four out of five children crawl out of the family court system in a way what we call a semi orphan You know, a loss of a parent is something that as a society we consider as one of the greatest trauma to a child. And unfortunately, that is something that we are seeing in 80% of children. And this is because very, very, very long time, that's almost about 9 to 14 months it takes to even get a basic interim access order. And what is the quantity of that interim access order? No more than 14 to 18 hours per month. 
you know, I say this not very lightly, but jailed convicts have get better visitation orders compared to the child wanting to visit or be a part of the parent. And, 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 I'm, and I'm shocked about the simple fact that even simple parenting tools like telephone calls, information, medical information, access to, uh, you know, at least the school and the school PTMs, that is given to less than 10% of the children. Now, this is a phenomena, and none of these orders, I mean, less than one third of these orders actually get complied with. And the rest, two thirds, which don't get complied with, the contempt court cases, there is absolutely no action taken in more than 95% of those cases. This is a phenomena which we call as parentectomy. Just the way, you know, the removal of appendix is known as appendicectomy. Removal of gallbladder is known as cholecystectomy. Just the same way we are removing deliberately one parent from a child's life. But having recounted this in your experience, what are the two or three major issues which are the cause for these kind of uh, you know traumatic orders for the children being passed? Um, Dr. Kapoor, I would really honestly put the onus on a lawyer. I think if as the Family Court Act very categorically says that a litigant is not entitled to a lawyer by right, it is only with the permission of the court. When a court notes a particular lawyer, the demeanor, the history, I really don't think you need a lawyer to represent visitation or access. That should just be a done thing. What are we trying to say or do? And sometimes it's unfortunate that even when the family court grants certain orders, the custodial parent takes it in appeal. I think, according to me, the high court should really not interfere in these orders because finally the family court is seized of the matter. They do pass orders after hearing, seeing the, uh, you know, facts of the case and um, you just set aside, there's no stern action taken against a, a violating parent, there is nothing done. So how do you set precedent? How do you warn them? How do you, you know, say that how, how a husband is put in jail because he doesn't pay maintenance? True. Why is there nothing in place for a parent who doesn't give access? I think that that, that is a call of the day. Like in the Rajneesh and Neha judgment, uh, where we are supposed to file uh, documents, affidavits. Yes. They're saying decide um, access, I mean, uh, maintenance applications within two months. Why are custody on access applications being decided in over a year? So, uh, there needs to be some directive by the Supreme Court. I think a joint parenting plan is the call of the day. And there should be no two ways about it. I mean, there is a judgment where even a criminal is allowed to meet his child. So what are we doing? Why should one parent have once in an alternate week? Applications are being filed that parents should not be asked to involve in the school, in the academics. What are you literally, how is a lawyer even drafting such an application? And why? Why is it even being entertained? Yes, Jatin, please. Yeah, ma'am, we have also seen that we have parents living in the close vicinity, just a stone throw distance away from each other, even they are getting access sometimes in the children complex room or once in a month for two hours or three hours as such. So, how do you are uh, muted. It's really sad. 
it's really sad. The situation is sad. And how much ever you plead, you ask, you question, why? What's wrong with me? And the most disastrous of all is the introduction of POXO. Where women are not hesitating under legal guidance to use POXO to deter a father from taking visitation. That is the most obnoxious behavior. Now, uh, you know, that's one of the findings which also came in our survey was that today almost about 13% of cases, there are false allegations of sexual abuse against uh, the, the father in most circumstances, which is there. You know, one of the things that I look at is you know, let's forget the damage that happens to the targeted parent or the father uh, against whom such an allegation has been made. I don't, you know, so there have been multiple studies which have taken place which say that the child who is making such an allegation or is a party to such an allegation along with the parent goes through almost the same kind of trauma of actually being sexually abused, right? And therefore, and it's a lifelong handicap which actually happens. But let me let me uh, take that a little further to ask you two questions simultaneously. And you could so number one is of course a parent who makes such an allegation of false sexual abuse allegation, right? Can that parent be allowed to continue with you know even custody of the child? I mean that is preposterous. There are multiple judgments all across the world which says such an allegation is so against the best interests and welfare of the child that it should become not just a red flag, but almost like a clear cut, this thing of saying this parent is not good for the child, right? That's that's uh, obviously uh, one. But secondly, you know, slightly I may... Uh, be a little provocative to ask you the second question and the same, which you could answer uh, both simultaneously. Do you believe that there is a kind of a reverse gender discrimination in the family courts which is happening? Do you think that there is an issue around fathers not being given their due importance and rights uh, to be an equal partner in child rearing compared to mothers? Well, yes, answering point number two first. Fathers are only being treated as ATM machines. Pay. The minute you go and say that I'm not getting access, the defense is you're not paying maintenance. So if I don't pay maintenance because the order of maintenance may be adverse or my inability or whatever reason, even the pandemic, I am not, I'm not justified. The wife is justified rather in not giving me the access. Poxo, I think the mother who uses this law as an option, her mindset is not proper and definitely access should be shifted. Definitely. If not to the father because of an allegation, because whatever reason, it should not be with the mother, maybe grandparents. Maybe it should go to the grandparents. But such a mother who can think on those lines and be advised, it is a definite no no. And as, and as you rightly said, it just shocks my conscience of, I can understand. You know, uh, a father and a mother having a fight or a husband and wife, and sometimes they can go a little insane during these periods. However, how do you justify a lawyer who is sitting down and actually drafting such a uh, allegation? Because nine out of ten times the lawyer is aware that this is not a true allegation, right? And therefore, I, I think uh, somewhere... Uh, accountability of lawyers to, on this needs to be ascertained. Uh, do you think which body can actually bring in this kind of accountability? Is it 
the bar council should be the supreme court should be the high court how how can we ensure that you know some of these bad fish which spoil the name of the entire legal community right i was literally pained when the chief justice of madras high court said that it is no longer uh, respectable to introduce oneself as a lawyer or a judge right it it's it's a painful uh, it's a painful experience which or a painful statement which i'm sure uh, the chief justice would have thought 10 times before making it right who can play a role should it be the bar council the supreme court high courts family courts who i think a judge of the family court can really decide this they are aware of their regular practitioners yes i think if a poxo is filed immediately immediately the judge should look at the caliber of the lawyer because each lawyer has a reputation and a conduct and a generic practice the mode of practice a uh, typical application that will be filed typical representations in the court for every client who is a custodial parent why is it that the courts believe the such people when it comes to access but doesn't believe the husband when it comes to his finances yeah you know so i think basically the judges can note the conduct but then at the same time a poxo is filed in a different court where lawyers are allowed in criminal courts i think the minute a poxo is filed there should be a connection and there should be a finding of whether there is a matrimonial dispute or not yes to relate to it i think we have judgments which have noted the you know false poxo cases that are being filed and that people and lawyers and the system is looking into it and reprimanding for it poxo is also to be decided expeditiously yes. but can we not understand as even a lay person what the connect is suddenly husbands and fathers have become you know sexual predators to their own children it's so it's so understood but still what do we do because the law says you need to prove the poxo act is so lethal i mean it was put into place for other offenders not a father so unfortunately like every other law it's being misused and i think this should really be in fact one of my matters when the poxo act was just implemented i would like to say that it was used against my client suddenly out of the blue and there were two children both had narrated the same statement the minute the father gave up all rights because that is what he was you know literally pressured to gave up rights to see his children suddenly poxo is being quashed and there was a noting of the honorable high court division bench which i won't take names Sure. mentioning specifically that the statements of the two children have been recorded parrot like noting how this was done but of course that was too new a stage today there, there is a judgment which says you can't even quash a poxo correct because that is a complaint for the child so today when women are filing poxo what is happening the husband has to undergo that trial ma i think the bigger issue is see section 21 to 23 of the poxo act gives you the powers to the court to punish the false uh, uh, people who make such false allegations i haven't come across a single such judgment in spite of hundreds of such false allegations where the section 21 and the punishment has been given to the false allegation 
person who's made the fault. Why are the judges so scared to use the powers that they have been granted by the constitution? Well, I really don't know how to answer that question because the judge would be in a better position to. But sometimes in the family court, when the family court has been bold enough to grant access, I'm talking about family court. Unfortunately, high court stays it. So even when a family court is trying to be bold and, you know, seeing the facts of the case and granting and believing that it should be joint or appropriate is pulled back because, I mean, no judge would want to have this, their order being set aside or, you know, interfered or things. With. So I think it would be a general uh, rule for every lower court who, who is maybe thinking that, you know, what will happen above? Yes. Yes. So yes. and and try and take so long. So till you don't prove until you don't reach that end where you know you can show that the complaint was false, yes. there can't be such a step. Right? And also the lady who's making this poxo complaint, or the man, father, whoever it may be realizes that the complaint is false and decides to settle before. That's true. So how many POXO cases have really reached the end is what we need to consider. Maybe it should be on a day-to-day -day basis and expedited within a month or something like that to really have an outcome to that. True. true. No, I think uh, somewhere... Uh, personally, I think it's a whole systemic failure. I think what I believe is, number one, the Family Courts Act is a very progressive and a beautifully drafted legislation, giving the powers to the high courts, frame rules, make, and we are giving you all the powers. But it's been about 35 years now, almost. Not a single rule framing. The high courts are just not acting on it. You were part of, I believe, a conference which, uh, you know, all of us did with NCPCR saying you are the main body to look after the UNCRC, that is United Nations Child Rights Conventions, this thing. However, it's been four years and uh, you have the minutes of the meeting which clearly say that the NCPCR and WCD should be working together on it. Yet for last four years, nobody has taken any action on it. Right. So I'm saying the judges are not the high courts and the Supreme Courts are not looking into this issue. The government and the NCPC are the constitutional bodies are not looking into the issue. How can we wake up the conscience of the people who are sitting here saying almost about a lakh and a half children every year are being put through this trauma of a lifelong handicap? Where and who is going to listen? Ma'am, you are... Uh... I think what you are doing is commendable. I am on this chat hoping that these voices are heard. I am hoping for that awakening. Why the institutions and the courts are being mute spectators... I really cannot say. It's equally frustrating for me to see. I mean, I'm seeing it before my eyes. The opponent lawyers teach their client's child, whoever is the custodial parent. The opponent lawyers are telling the child, go kick your father. Don't talk to him. Hit him with something. Run away. Start crying so everybody can see. I'm hearing it with my own ears and I'm questioning them. Would you do this to your child? I mean, how would you feel if it were your child? We are teaching the children to be disrespectful, to become pretenders, liars, and giving them, instilling the negativity. I mean, our culture teaches us to respect our elders, to learn from them not to behave like this with them. It is 
I just, the children's complex, that small little room, there's yes. no ventilation. There are children there. Even if one child is fine and happy to meet the non-custodial parent, there are 10 children screaming away. That child is also traumatized. Why? Why have it in a children's complex? Absolutely. And, and even if you want to, I don't think it's fair to have a, a small room with no ventilation. I mean, I'm talking with respect to the family court Bandra. Yes. At Mumbai. Yes. It's pathetic. There's just no room to play. And what supervision? Okay, you want to supervise? I'm happy. I'm happy that there is supervision so that at least the lies can be caught. But have it outside in the natural surrounding in the house of the parent. Get a court commissioner appointed. Do video videography. But why this small 4x4 four four room? It's pathetic. It is true. So we have to wake up and I think the efforts put in by your good self and Child Rights Foundation is really commendable. And I really wish with your messages going around the survey, the amount of work that you people are putting in, I really wish you good luck and God bless you all for this because it is really, really required. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. No, really. Other thing what we are finding is, you know, there is no clinical psychologist or child psychologist being appointed by family courts, which is the need of the hour. Jatin, I think there is in family court Bandra, yeah, apart there from Bandra, are, Maharashtra, there are some, some psychologists through NGOs, Muskan or the other NGOs. Yes. Psychologists, but in other states, there are no psychologists in the family court. Right, right. That I am with you. I am not, I am only talking and, about Bombay. But unfortunately, Jatin, even, even our Muskan and all the people involved here, who is listening to their reports? Right. You know, the courts are not considering it enough. To understand, I mean, I have made applications. Okay, fine. You believe that my child doesn't want to meet me. Please send him for counseling to understand why he would make such a statement to a judge. Right. Now, that is also being granted with so much reluctance. And the custodial parent does not take the child for counseling. And nothing is done to that flouting of that order. So, you know, it's a chain reaction where there is no action taken by a custodial on a custodial parent for flouting consecutive orders. Actually, ma'am, now what we feel is, you know, there has to be a strict protocol to deal with parental alienation of children Absolutely. and non-compliance of visitation orders. Arrest the, non arrest the parent who is flouting. If a husband can be arrested for not paying maintenance, why can't a parent, custodial parent be for not giving access? It ought to be there. Some consequences, if not arrest, impose heavy costs. Do something, but do it because we are destroying the children. So many of my matters, the children have become majors during the pendency. Then we have certain judgments with all due respect to the Honorable Supreme Court where statements and uh, of uh, wishes of the child is being considered. You. But you are failing to consider the back of what has led the child to make such statements. True. I mean, at one stage we say a child is a minor. He can't be a witness. He can't be, you know, uh, testifying. So isn't this the kind of a, uh, you know, uh, testimony of a child? So how, how are you considering? Especially when you know the backdrop of the facts of the matter. We really need an overhaul of the system. We can't. And the family court can't do much, no, because the Supreme Court is saying wishes of the child are paramount. So, 9, 10, 11 year old children come to court and say, we don't want to meet our father. And okay, fine. That's the end of it. 
and by the time from family court to high court you go and from high court to supreme court it takes almost years and years absolutely it's it's a i'm sorry it's a farce it's a farce when it comes to access and custody issues there should be a time frame to decide these there should be awareness and i really think lawyers should be reprimanded they should but, be but coming to the point which you raised about these child interviews and so called wishes of the child or voice of the child you know in some ways our legislators are actually far superior than our judiciary though the public opinion may be very different because if you look at it the juvenile justice act right which they clearly state in the preamble of the act that this is meant to completely codify the best interests and welfare of the child the section 7 clearly says no child should be brought to a premises which even resembles a court which even resembles a court and we have children being called i have personally seen children as young as 4 or 5 years old being asked a question are beta kis ke sath rehna hai maa ke sath ki baap ke sath i mean they can't be a bigger you know i mean i'm sorry for the use of word it's blasphemy it is it is terrible and it's so these child interviews as uh, jatin very rightly said our judges are not cannot we cannot expect our judges to know everything they need to be assisted by child psychologists who conduct such interviews who formulate joint parenting plans depending on situation case to case i can understand there can be differences who diagnose parental alienation and who give reports for which the judges must justify why are they ignoring those reports i can understand in certain rare cases they may ignore such reports for whatever reasons but justify it in your order but none of that is actually happening right so so i think uh, somewhere a body so one of the things that we interviewed with uh, a very very well renowned uh, judge justice philip marcus and he very clearly stated you know number he said two very important things one parental alienation is a public health issue the cost of which for not treating it and intervening early is far greater than anything else that we can actually think of but secondly he said there is a worldwide change in thinking of creating a separate cadre of family court judges and he actually even gave recommendations of how to prevent their burnout because we understand the emotional uh, uh, investment for a pay, uh, for a judge in a family court case is far greater than a civil or a criminal case so to prevent the the burnout but we must have a separate cadre of trained and motivated family court judges uh, sorry for my long monologue but is that what you believe uh, could could help solve the problem well um coming to this aspect of appointing counselors for the child yeah. i would say you know that is a very long process it would take a minimum of 6 months and i apprehend a misuse of that as well a parent will know that you know the court will refer the child for counseling till such time the child won't meet the parent who is not in uh, uh, in contact it will stretch out the time yeah. and they will opt for it now with the more and more and more kids being referred for these counseling things there will be more backlog there will be more time consumed with the counselors there will be a further delay now coming to the qualifications of judges i agree with you they should have basic training in child psychology why child psychology i would say they should have basic training in overall psychology human mind because in reality we have to treat the parent 
who is causing this alienation yes. the child is innocent the child is a pawn yes. the child will do out of emotional blackmail what the custodial parent will say the base is the parent so and even if you decide to send a child for counseling i think the counseling should be joined with the non custodial parent yes yes so that the child meets that non custodial parent and the custodial parent then doesn't misuse this process to delay the visitation correct you know so i mean these are just things that are now coming to my mind uh, um, i could be completely wrong i mean these are solely my views yeah. impromptu but no we really really need to do something it's not happening i mean the suicidal rates the the, the survey that you have you know forwarded is disturbing it's disturbing what society are we giving rise to that's true that's true i mean we as sorry yes yeah actually please, 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 yeah. Please. in abroad you know there is a concept of doctrine of friendly parent which has been widely used this concept is not being used in our courts actually in the interim itself because right from the interim said the moment the access orders are passed alienation starts happening but the concept of doctrine of friendly parent is not being adopted it should be it should be propagated it should be publicized i think every lawyer should be made to maybe give an oath not to alienate a child not to encourage their client to return the brief if there's no lawyer representing a miscreant devious client what can he or she do absolutely absolutely Ma But rule number thirty-seven states that the Japan, you are uh, muted. Yeah, the family court rule thirty-seven states a court needs to uh, record why an advocate is appointed. Similarly, courts also need to, you know, dismar an advocate who has been not obeying the orders of the court. Series of alienations is being happening, so they can be barred by the court for from appearances. That is exactly what I'm saying. You should implement Section Thirteen. Why give permission when you know? Why have a lawyer to decide access? The court should say you are both parents. If suppose you are living, there are so many parents living up and down on one floor difference, a few bungalows apart. What is the problem? The school is in the same area. What are you thinking? Why have a lawyer to try and make the other parent look bad? Don't have lawyer representation for access. Make it a rule, fifty-fifty. Why should it's the child's right, right? I mean, we are at the end of the day talking about a child's right. The child's right is love of both parents. So why would a child decide not to have love of the other parent if he's not tutored to say it? It's unheard of, no? I mean, unless you are some abusive parent. having anti precedents of you know violence and being abusive being alcoholic or being known see the backlog of a person otherwise it should just be a clear cut i'm sorry there's no question for an application if you are not allowing the non parent to meet the child that no, that non custodial parent in fact should come and tell the court i am not getting and the court should give it why should a non custodial parent even file an application now like this same ma'am the moment a parent has to go to the court to ask to visit his child or meet his child parental alienation has already begun absolutely that's what i'm saying right absolutely so i think uh, abduction what about abduction you're leaving you're running away states countries and we are helpless we are injunction not injunction orders sorry we are not even signing age convention yes we should why are we not signing 
Well, I think uh, the biggest issue as I see it for why we are not signing and why the IPCA cases are building up day by day or the international parent-child abduction cases is because we refuse to recognize the child and his child rights as an individual. We are always looking at the child as, a, you know, to copy the language from the Honorable Supreme Court, we are looking at the child as an appendage of the mother. Right, which which is a very very dangerous thing, and which is actually extremely antithetical to what the United Nations and India has signed to that the child is an individual with rights, and any civilized society will tell you that the rights of the child are at a higher platform than anybody else because that child is unable to speak voice his or her concerns and is the future of our society. Yet, we are unable to appreciate the rights of a child alone as an individual, which is the reason. Uh, but do you think the what should be done? You know, the Rajesh Bindal Committee report in uh, on uh, the Hague Convention, signing of Hague Convention, has taken... Those 10% or 5% of the cases where there is domestic violence and abuse and use that to paint the entire community as domestic violence and domestic abusers. Do you think that was a, a reasonable report and do you think that report is something that needs to be revisited? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That report needs to be uh, looked at in a in a in a in a completely different note with some data, with some scientific research. Unfortunately, there was not a single psychologist used who could speak about parental alienation in that report. So, which is something that I think we should definitely look at. But uh, you know, coming to the end and the real question, if I were to ask you, what are the three or for or whatever you feel clear reforms or your suggestions you know which will institutionally change the the whole family court system what could those two or three be point number one don't have lawyer representation for access point number two i don't think a father or a non-custodial parent mother should approach the court for being given access. They should approach the court complaining about not being given access. Point number three, let the court at least have not blindly follow higher court orders. I'm talking about the lower courts. Every case Merits are different. You cannot just pick and choose certain directives of a higher court and put it with another court, another matter because they cannot be related. No two cases are the same. The basic foundation that the court needs to consider are rights of children, which unfortunately is being in the back foot and what is in the front is allegation, which are not even yes. proved. Never. If a court has doubts, if the allegations are really serious, the court can appoint a court commissioner, video record the access, have a supervision in a normal surrounding for the child, not in the four by four room in the court. Appoint a counsellor for the child immediately along with the non-custodial parent to be attended those sessions for. To understand. And when the court finds out that it is the custodial parent, I think there should just be immediate shift of custody. If, if at least certain things are and implemented, I think there would gradually be a change. True. True. 
I think. No, I think wonderful. Uh, so, you know, I'll summarize what I uh, have uh, taken in from this wonderful and Jatin, then you could summarize from what you feel. Uh, you know, I think there is a beautiful statement which Ms. Irani has in our own words put it, which is children don't need your presence. They need your presence. Unfortunately, what we are doing is by putting too much emphasis, and especially for a spiritual country like India, we are putting out a very wrong message to the society that it is money and maintenance which matters more than the presence of a parent, which by itself is going to be extremely harmful for our future generation because the materialistic tendencies can actually uh, culminate into something very, very poor. Uh, in, a, in a very, very poorly developed society. Uh, secondly, I think she uh, very beautifully summarized saying, have a counselor definitely, immediately on board whenever you suspect even minor amount and intervene early. Number three, I think she very rightly said, keep the lawyers out of the game unless it is a completely illiterate person who just cannot speak his or her own mind in the court, in which case also I would suggest use uh, amicus or a court-appointed uh, lawyer, uh, which, 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 which would uh, this thing. And lastly, I think uh, that's my personal view. Family law is less about law. It's more about at the cusp of science and law. It is about humans. Let's try and deal with it in a far more human way. You know, why should we have an infrastructure where a judge is sitting on a podium? Why not have a round table where a discussion happens and people just go about their ways, right? So those are some of my final thoughts. Uh, Jatin, anything you would like to add, please? Ma'am has beautifully said whatever she said. That this is what exactly needs to be implemented and this is exactly what is the need of the R actually. Wonderful. Wonderful. I, I would just like to make one line. The higher courts believe that a non-custodial parent should not be a guest in the life of a child. But I most regretfully say it's not about even being a guest. They are being made ghosts. True. Before we destroy the very fabric of our future society, there has to be a change. And I thank you for putting in so much time and effort to even do this much. Thank you. With a sincere hope and prayer that it creates that awakening, which is so much required. Yes, thank you. We also hope the very same now. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you so Thank much, you so much ma'am. Thank you.